And so uh, later on, we will upload the session onto the library's YouTube channel. So if you want to review anything, or if you're afraid that you missed anything, it will be there and I'll send out the link for everybody. Um, with that done, let's get to the meat of tonight's session. Today's talk is on the art of the scandal about all the nefarious criminal acts that have been carried out in the art world of fine arts. And we are so lucky and I feel very privileged to have Jane O'Neill here as the speaker today. Jane is the founder of Culturally Curious. It's an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. So she curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. So Jane holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. She's born and raised in New Hampshire and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held a role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. So if you have, you want to find out more about Jane or you want to see what Culturally Curious is really about uh, or find out more about it, you can go to imculturallycurious.com and I'll put this in the chat um, in a minute. And so I'm going to hand the floor off to Jane. All right, thank you so much, Peishan. I am just delighted to be with you tonight and I'm absolutely honored that all of you chose to take an hour out of your day to learn a little bit more about the art world and you know these great stories of really true crime that go along with it. So we are going to be focusing on wonderfully kind of fascinating and salacious stories tonight, but because I have this background in education, I can't help but also share a little bit of information about the art itself, because otherwise we get to a sort of so what moment, you know, who cares if this one's stolen, who cares if that one's broken. I mean, if you don't appreciate the art to begin with, uh, it, it, you know, it's just a series of cr meaningless crimes, really. So to kind of set the stage and to get us thinking sort of big picture, thefts, vandals, and forgeries, I wanted to give um, sort of some context, a little bit of background, a bigger picture kind of example of what we're thinking about. So when we think big picture around theft and cultural theft, stealing artifacts is as old as culture itself. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with these two images that I have up on the screen here. This is, of course, the Parthenon on the Acropolis in, in Athens, Greece, um, one of the most famous ancient monuments of all time. And then over here on the left are the sculptures that were designed specifically for that monument. Um, they were designed for this little triangular spot at the top here. And you'll notice they are not there. They are nowhere, uh, it, they're not in Athens at all. In fact, they were sold to the British Museum by a, a man by the name of Lord Elgin. And so they're now the, the so-called famous Elgin or Elgin marbles. And so these kind of site-specific, just absolutely fantastic sculptures are now set apart from their original context. You could argue that they are maybe better preserved because they're in a world-class museum. But I think that the people of Greece and the people of Athens would certainly want them back to tell the complete story of this incredible incredible monument from their history. So uh, a, a, a fire sale price or a, th a theft of a cultural artifact like this is tale as old as time, really. We are also thinking tonight about the destruction of art works today. And so when we think about that in um, within the scope of the history, the greater scope of history, we know that this is a, almost always an assertion of power or authority. Sometimes it's done really intentionally by armies or by revolutionaries. Sometimes it's done just by uh, solitary uh, uh, individuals, solitary actors. So we know, of course, that um, when the US invaded Iraq a couple decades 
decades ago, we go right in and one of the first things we do was tear down monuments, tear down sculptures of Saddam Hussein. And that was an assertion of our authority in that land. And, um, and today, you know, there are still kind of these, these debates raging about the removal of Confederate monuments, but over here on the left, we have an image that was created right around the time of the Civil War. And it's an imagined rendering of, uh, of American revolutionaries tearing down a sculpture of King George. So it's, um, it's something that has sort of always been at play once again, but it's, uh, it's a thorny kind of cultural touchstone. Uh, so we'll be considering that, that idea of, of destroying art objects tonight as well. And then finally, the notion of fraud, the notion of copying something and passing it off on your own. This is a sensational work of art by an American artist named Samuel F. B. Morse. It was painted in 1831 and it's called Painting in the Gallery of the Louvre. And so what we see here are a series of art students who are stationed around the famous Louvre Museum galleries, and they are all busy at work creating their copies of already famous masterworks. You might be able to recognize a few right off the bat here. So, um, so where do we draw the line between a copy and a forgery? Well, we're going to sort of walk that tightrope a little bit later on today. So. Let me give you a sense in terms of the materials we'll co we're covering and how we'll spend this next hour together. Our art high section here is our longest. So if it feels like it's going a little long, that's gonna take up most of our time. We're going to start off with the Mona Lisa. We have a silent film here where somebody's sort of wa waltzing away with the Mona Lisa and, uh, and then turn our attention to Hitler and his cultural ambitions during World War II and then wrap up with a story that's pretty close to home with the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum. Then we'll turn our attention to art attacks and vandalism, um, some master, some master uh, artists like Michelangelo and Rembrandt, and then a contemporary artist, Banksy, and then wrap it up with forgery and a mix of probably well-known and, um, and soon to be well-known <laughs> artists. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover. I'm going to be talking fast and moving as quickly as possible. We are going to get started with art heists and the Mona Lisa. So we are, of course, looking at the most famous painting in the world, one of the most recognizable images on the planet. This is Leonardo da Vinci's 1503 painting, The Mona Lisa, um, famous in its own right for so many reasons. This was, um, this was a painting that Leonardo da Vinci was particularly attached to himself. He kept it, even though it's a portrait of a, 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 a well-known individual in this case, his particular attachment to it, I think, sort of inflamed a lot of curiosity about this. This work of art. But, um, but really, I, I think the reason why this work is so famous is because it represented a revolution in terms of painting during its time. Leonardo da Vinci ushered in this brand new way, this brand new approach really, to painting faces, to painting hands. So prior to da Vinci, you had works like the one over here on the left. I, I really love this painting on the left. It's by an, uh, another Italian Renaissance artist named Lorenzo Costa. It's right here in my hometown museum at the Courier. But this is more of a linear style of painting. This artist is using these kind of hard edges to define the elements of his painting. Da Vinci, on the other hand, is using this kind of hazy shading technique. There's no hard outline that any one of us might use if we were giving a, given a pencil and asked to draw a face. We'd start off with a, with a circle or an oval. Da Vinci has no hard outlines here. So it's all of this smudging that the Italians called sfumato. And so the smudging creates the, the sense of a real sort of sculptural form here, the, um, the dimensions of a human face. He use, and, and he does it with the hands as well. So he uses this to great effect around her eyes, to define her nose, and he gives her that famous Mona Lisa smile. Now you might think, you know, what, what makes this smile so famous? Well, uh, neuroscientists have actually studied the way our eye perceives 
that smile. And because of that very subtle shading, Da Vinci was able to accomplish something. He made a smile that at first glance seems more broad than it actually is. So if you look away and then glance at the Mona Lisa, it seems like she's giving you a little smirk. But if you spend a little more time with her, it's really just a you know very subtle upturned mouth. So that's that's some of the fame of the Mona Lisa. But does that really merit this kind of crowd? I'm sure most of you have been to the Louvre Museum or have it on your list. And you know, I mean, people are just running through that huge museum just to see this tiny little painting which is, is really kind of inaccessible. So what is all the fuss about? Well, it's because the Mona Lisa was stolen. And I think a lot of people aren't really aware of this or familiar with the uh, how expansive the crime actually was. So in 1911, a man who was um, uh, originally from Italy, but working at the Louvre Museum in Paris, he actually just took the Mona Lisa off the wall at the end of the day and walked out of the museum with it. And as somebody who's worked in a number of museums, I can tell you that, um, that this is a problem even to this day. Artworks get moved around by some staff that don't communicate it with the other staff. And, and so, you know, as an educator, if I went to go give a tour and there was a painting missing from the wall, I would just think, oh, a curator moved it. And so the Mona Lisa was gone for more than 24 hours before anyone realized that it was stolen. And just to give you a sense in terms of the, uh, the room where she was hung, you can see that she wasn't, she wasn't the, the showstopper in this space. She was a, a, like a little blip in a, in a room filled with major paintings. So it wasn't as though there was a crush of people trying to see her and they were all disappointed. It was just, a, you know, another transition of an object in a museum gallery. So what happened? So this painting was missing for a full two years. There was this outpouring of emotion, sort of similar to like when Princess Diana died, you know, people were just crushed. And that is when she became an icon. People already loved her before that. People were sending her um, love letters at the Louvre before she had been uh, before she had been stolen. But after that, I mean, it, it, people wanted to look like her. Women were powdering their faces, uh, making it making their faces look yellow, and trying to sort of affect that same kind of smile. So, um, so, so people became attached to her in a in a whole new way. And then ultimately, the painting was discovered when this Italian national tried to sell it about two years later out of his hotel room. Now. Um, the painting was restored to the museum. It got slightly better billing, you know, a little bit more space to breathe and um, a little bit of more space for the audience that was so interested in it after this point. But then it becomes this cultural touchstone and it becomes a way for people to express their frustrations really with the French government or with the museum in itself. So you can see over here, over the years, people have actually attacked the Mona Lisa as well. So like many of the work Works that we'll be looking at today. The Mona Lisa is behind bullet, bulletproof glass today. Uh, one of the last times it traveled, 1962, it had a $100 million insurance policy. Uh, it's estimated that it would be well over $600 million if this object were to be moved from the Louvre today. So you, you can imagine that they would take those decisions very seriously. So we're going to turn our attention now away from this uh, beloved iconic work of art and turn our attention to uh, an artist who maybe isn't as beloved as Leonardo da Vinci. We are looking at two absolutely proficient and adequate works of art here. Uh, there's a great interest in architecture. There's uh, some nostalgic realism over here on the right. The artist is a name that we are all familiar with for better and definitely for worse. And the artist here is Adolf Hitler. Many people uh, forget that he began his real, he launched himself as an artist, as an, as an aspiring artist. He always dreamed that he could be a great 
artist. But of course, um, things go sideways for him. He he um, never really, well, he, he didn't gain entrance into the art school of his dreams. And so he was just kind of eking out a living. World War I happens and uh, it sets him on a path towards politics and away from art. But art is always this kind of organizing principle in his life, so much so that as he's um, once he becomes chancellor of, of Germany, a dictator, he, um, he begins planning uh, um, attacks and um, invasions based around his desire for art. And, and what we're looking at over here on the right is a, a little architectural model of his hometown. And he always dreamed that this little provincial hometown that he'd grown up in, which was Linz in Austria, that that hometown could become an imperial city. And right at the heart of this imperial city would be his imagined museum. And his dream museum in this case would house the greatest works of art in all of the world. So he had massive ambitions that were related to art. And so, as I mentioned, all of his military campaigns were woven in to the theft, to the forced sale, and to the acquisition of works of art from around Europe. I think when all was said and done um, during, during World War II, it was something like 20% of all of the artwork had been moved, exchanged hands, um, uh, essentially stolen by the Nazis. We're looking at this absolutely gorgeous castle, Neuschweinstein Castle in Bavaria in Germany, which was considered to be not a military target. So it was one of the places that Nazis began to store work, stolen works of art. And you can still go there today and visit it. It's on my bucket list. It's such a picturesque uh, castle here. It's actually the inspiration for Walt Disney's uh, Snow White Castle at Disneyland. And when you go inside, when the allies went inside, they found room after room that was jam packed with not just paintings and sculpture, but decorative art items, um, tapestries, drawings, engravings, everything you could imagine. And that was even after the Nazis began to move these artifacts. They decided, um, getting close to the end of the war, to move as much as they could underground for safety because, I mean, there were bombings and that sort of thing happening. So Hitler and the Nazis identified an underground salt mine in Austria. Uh, it's about a quarter of a mile underground and they moved roughly five, 6,000 masterwork art objects underground into the salt mine. And they created their own system of storage underground. They created curators offices and even a lab to restore these works that they were moving. Sometimes they were moving these artworks by, um, by tank, sometimes on, on carts being pulled by oxen, but some of the world's greatest works of art ended up underground in this salt mine, which in some ways was a great place for it because during a war, they were not going to be bombed. Um, they weren't going to be exposed to light and the salt actually helped to um, control the humidity. So that was the one good thing to come out of this. So I wanted to share with you the big sort of so what about all of this. I wanted to share with you one masterwork that was, in, that was sort of at the heart of all of this art theft that was happening during World War II. We are looking at a massive painting called an altarpiece that opens up like the shutters of a window. It can open and close. And this altarpiece is roughly 11, 12 feet high. So these figures are just under life size. It was painted at the beginning of the 1400s, the early Renaissance. And it was painted in the North by the Van Eyck brothers. This was a revolution in painting because prior to this, you have got artists who are painting manuscripts, illuminating manuscripts, making small devotional works. And this was something that could command a room. It was created for, um, for a church cathedral setting, really. And it would almost always remain closed as we see it here right now. The colors are fairly muted, but there is an important story being told across the front here. The Annunciation with the angel Gabriel here describing or telling Mary that she is divinely pregnant. But the showstopper 
happens when you open up this altar piece. So let me just give you a sense of what that looks like with the scale of human beings down here who are um, involved in moving this hu these huge panels. And when it is wide open, you can see it's the color is technicolor. Imagine living in the 1400s with virtually no beautiful uh, uh, visual stimulation in your life. Wouldn't you go to church every day if you could see something like this? This, this would have been the most beautiful thing these people had laid their eyes on. And it is, of course, telling the story of Christianity here. Now, I'm going to zoom in on some of the, uh, some of the most spectacular details around this painting, just to give you a sense of, of some awe and appreciation here. There's so much to see. Now, right at the top center, Oftentimes, this uh, this figure here gets mistaken to as um, as Jesus, a, 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 a reasonable mistake because that's usually where Jesus would be. But in this case, the Van Eyck brothers had actually painted God the Father, an unusual choice. Most of the time, you don't show God. But I want to kind of zoom in for you here. You have a sense of scale. You can get really. Uh, close to God's face here and see the level of minute detail that is involved in the painting of this work of art. You can see individualized hairs on the face of God here. And my eye always goes, I think there's just like one white hair in his beard here. But I mean, the Van Eyck brothers were, were painting with paintbrushes that were probably a single hair in one case. And that's how rich the detail is. We can see this remarkable reflection off of the gems and the pearls here. If we zoom out once again, we can see that God is wearing this triple crown of heaven and at his feet is the, is the earthly crown of our world. And I just want to zoom in on that crown for you because once again, it's just spectacular in terms of the, the ornamentation here. And so you can imagine the kinds of people that would flood into this cathedral just to see this. So, um, so in order to kind of tell the story of Christianity, the Van Eyck brothers have, you know, God the Father, uh, they have Mary the Virgin, uh, Jesus's mother, we have John the Baptist over here. Whenever you see nudes, it's safe to say it's Adam and Eve flanking them on either side, some angels singing and making music. But down below, it, really right in front of people's faces or the viewers, is this really elaborate scene here. And it's called um, the mystical lamb. With this highly detailed picture, you can see dozens of figures pouring into this meadow around this altarpiece where there is a lamb um, up on this, this altar shedding blood. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in here, but, but notice, you know, just let your eye pour over the riches, richness of them. This, there is, you know, this contemporary cities in the background, um, uh, you know, legions of women, people praying. Uh, the detail here is, is so minute. You can actually read the text over these, these gentlemen's shoulders. But I'm just going to zero in on this lamb who is, of course, a symbol of Christ here because he's surrounded by angels that have the instruments of, um, of Christ's uh, torture and death behind him. So really, uh, as, we, as we zoom back out for just one moment, we have almost the entire story of Christianity told in this one remarkable painting. We have sin with Adam and Eve, and we have redemption down below with beautiful colors, minute details, powerful storytelling. So this would be a, a work of art that Hitler would want for his museum, circling back to Hitler here. So Hitler, um, uh, well, the Nazis ensured that this was stolen and that it was earmarked for Hitler's fantasy museum, which uh, of course was never actually built. So the allies, the, the, the monuments men that many people are familiar with, uh, a, a select group that was uh, there to kind of ensure the preservation of cultural artifacts, they found this entire altarpiece down in that salt mine, a quarter of a mile underground in Austria. And you can see what kind of shape it was in when they found it. So many of these works needed um, extensive restoration without this group of kind of military art experts, would we have ever seen this painting again? It's hard to imagine. Um, here's another detail of them sort of assessing it. Here's a few more details with uh, those, those uh, same uh, military figures standing 
with these separated panels here. So thank goodness they were there. Thank goodness they had the expertise that they had to restore this to the cathedral in Ghent um, so that we can still appreciate it today. Thank goodness Hitler's fantasy museum never came to be. Well, we're going to turn our attention now. Our last instance of theft here is another kind of fantasy museum, but not tied in with, with Nazism or any other um, uh, sort of uh, negative uh, uh, political uh, perspective. This is, of course, Isabella Stewart Gardner's uh, fantasy museum on the Fenway in Boston, Massachusetts. This is an older view before the Fenway was really kind of drained. Uh, this was her Venetian palace, uh, her fantasy uh, uh, setting for the art collection that she had amassed over um, several decades of traveling around Europe. I'm sure most of you have probably had the chance to go inside. It really is one of the most spectacular settings in all of New England. It has this interior courtyard. It's uh, glass enclosed. It feels feels like springtime every single day, even on the dreariest days in Boston. And, um, and downstairs in the sort of foundation of her museum, she has a lot of cultural artifacts from the classical past, and they serve as, as the foundation for the works in the galleries up above, the Renaissance and the Baroque. And so she has these galleries that, um, that are dense with her collections. There's, there's decorative arts, there's furniture, there's master works from, um, from various European countries. This is a view of the Raphael room over here on the left with her two Raphaels uh, that she placed right by the window here. She, of course, installed this entire collection in her museum. On the right, we are looking at a stained glass window from a Gothic cathedral, which is in her um, chapel, a consecrated chapel where they still hold services for her every year on her birthday because Isabella Stewart Gardner had sort of this outsized uh, power in the organization of this museum. This is, of course, the view of Isabel Stewart Gardner, painted by John Singer Sargent in 1888, uh, wearing this, you know, incredible black dress and all of these pearls at her neck, at her around her waist, and she's standing in front of a little fragment of a tapestry that's in her collection, and it sort of gives her, you know, a, a little bit of a halo, maybe some wings, but she positions herself as a saint. It sort of fits in place with um, so many of the other installations and art objects in her collection. And, and it's if you move through her museum organically, you sort of wind up here as your last stop. And she's almost arranged this painting as though it's a place to kind of give thanks. <laughs> so Isabel Stewart Gardner, like I said, had enormous authority in terms of how her museum would be organized and how it would be run in perpetuity. Because according to her will, nothing in the museum could ever be moved, changed, bought, or sold. Otherwise, the entire collection would be dismantled, shipped to Paris, auctioned off, and all the money would go to Harvard. And of course, things are just chugging along fine throughout the 20th century up until 1990, that fateful night. It was um, the night of uh, um, St. Patrick's Day in, in Boston. And so you can imagine there was a fair amount of celebrating. Two men dressed as Boston City police officers went to the back door, the staff entrance of the museum, rounded up the two guards that were working, um, uh, bound them uh, with, with handcuffs and duct tape, and then then spent about an hour and a half moving through the galleries, all three floors of it, and taking very precise uh, works of art. Now, I always imagine this is like Thomas Crown affair. They knew exactly what they wanted. They went in precision-like and just took it out, plucked it out, and then, you know, escaped into the night. But when you see the crime scene photographs, it's a little bit of a smash and grab. It's jarring to me to see broken glass and things just like lying on the ground like this. Uh, they, they went in and ripped things off the walls. They cut things out of frames, but at the same time, they also took the, the time and care to unscrew certain things to get it, uh, to, to get it so that it, uh, the objects were unsecured. Now, the room that we're looking at is the Dutch room in Mrs. Gardner's uh, museum. And you can see here that it was a very hard hit gallery in the, in 
the museum, major works stolen from the space. So I wanted to share with you just a couple of fun facts about those works of art. Two of them were major paintings by the artist Rembrandt, uh, a portrait of a couple here. Whenever I see it, I am reminded that Rembrandt was painting at the same time that the pilgrims came to America. It's sort of it's sort of funny to me to align those things with history, and we always think of our pure, uh, of our uh, puritanical pilgrims coming to America wearing these kinds of clothes, you know, with the starched collars and the black clothes. But as I look at this couple that Rembrandt painted, I also think of the fact that black clothes were some of the most expensive during that time because it took um, a great deal of dye in order to to make black clothes. This particular couple here with this, you know, these incredible outfits actually had their child included in this portrait, but um, it's believed that the child predeceased them and was later painted out, sort of a, a heartbreaking detail to this particular image. Over on the right is Rembrandt's only picture uh, that's a seascape, his only depiction of a boat on water, and it is just, um, the perfect representation of this Baroque period uh, during which uh, Rembrandt was, was living and working. Baroque art is really all about dynamism. It's, there's nothing that's balanced or stable. It has dramatic lighting. It has drama all around it. So in this case, the boat is tipping at this dramatic diagonal, sort of slicing the picture this way. There's just a little bit of light, a whole lot of darkness, and a whole lot of, well, there's this incredible sense of peril as we're looking at this scene. It's called Christ on the Sea of Galilee. And so we can see Christ in this boat with his apostles. Christ is at the, at the front of the boat, and he is actually preaching to a few of his apostles, trying to keep them calm in the midst of, of being, you know, tossed about by this tempest, while um, several other figures are working furiously to just secure the boat as the water is kind of pouring in. Here's just a detail here and a couple of elements that just make Rembrandt's painting so wonderful. He actually painted somebody getting sick over the edge of the boat, somebody just, you know, sitting right here next to Jesus himself. Um, but, you know, you can't help getting seasick. And then we have Rembrandt, who's painted his own self-portrait. He's included himself on the ship with Jesus, and he looks out directly at us, engaging us in this picture. What a painting. What a loss for, um, for, for the museum and for all of civilization to not have access to it. Now, I mentioned before that the thieves at the Gardner Museum, in some cases, really took their time. Uh, this is a tiny self-portrait. It's an etching by Rembrandt. It's about the size of a postage stamp, maybe about two inches tall. They found it uh, uh, in a tiny frame that was actually screwed into a piece of furniture. And they took the time to unscrew it just to take this little painting here. They took um, works by leading uh, impressionist artists, including Manet and Degas. And then they took um, artifacts that really aren't representative of Mrs. Gardner's uh, collection at all. Uh, in some cases, uh, works that almost seem like red herrings. This is an ancient Chinese beaker dating back to about 12,000 BC and, um, or 1200 BC, I should say, I'm sorry. And then over here on the right is um, a Napoleon uh, flag. It's the finial to the flag. It's not even the flag itself. They took the, the, the time to unscrew that. So there's a lot about the objects that were stolen, 13 in total, that leave a lot of questions. But without a doubt, the most important, the most valuable work of art that was stolen is this tiny painting called The Concert by the Dutch Baroque artist Vermeer. Now, Vermeer only painted about 35 works in his entire lifetime. It's not like Vermeer come up to auction every single day. This is a rare and irreplaceable work of art. And there's a, kind of a saucy story that goes along with it. So this was painted in 1664. And what we're looking at here is just three people making music together. We see various instruments on the table, on the floor, and we see this woman seated at this elaborate, sort of like a harpsichord. Uh, we see her sitting in profile. So we could be almost like begin to hear the sound 
as we're looking at this work of art. We can see the back of this gentleman here. He's got a stringed instrument in his hands. So we have the sound of, of uh, multiple instruments. And then we have this standing woman and she's got a piece of paper in her hand that she's reading. And just the simple little gesture, we, we understand that she is, is singing. So all of these figures are making music together. They're literally in a chord. There's, there's a sense of harmony here. But Vermeer wanted to suggest something maybe even a little bit more saucy. These Dutch Baroque artists love to include works of art in the back of their paintings that kind of help us uh, make sense of what's going on in the main picture. And in this case, he's included sort of a, a, a threesome in the back of, the, of, the, of this particular painting, three figures um, ha having an amorous encounter. And so it sort of, um, it sort of, it changes our understanding of this particular trio and the music making that is happening in the foreground. Now I'll wrap up our art heist section just by reminding you that those works are still missing. All the 13 works that were stolen from the Gardner in 1990 are still missing and there's a significant uh, reward if you happen to know anything about it. $10 billion. Um, why not? Why not help get those works back? I would be dying to see them in in real life. So one, one last note about, about art heists, they still happen around the globe today. There's a lot of museums out there that don't have um, uh, high tech security. Uh, and so they won't get robbed once, they'll get hit multiple times. Oftentimes uh, uh, museum boards think that, okay, we've been hit once, uh, th they're not gonna come back here, but it makes them a repeated target. These are thieves in broad daylight. Uh, robbing the um, the Edward the Edward Munch Museum in Oslo, Norway. So um, so that museum, it, for instance, has been hit multiple times. So we're going to turn our attention now to um, violence against against works of art, art attacks, and we are going to head from the Gardner Museum to the Vatican. So we are, of course, looking at the seat of Christendom here. We are looking at St. Peter's Basilica, a familiar site to so many people. Well, there's the Sistine Chapel just beyond it. And many of you have probably walked through this square just inside the largest church in Christendom. And one of the things that you see right inside, off to your right, is Michelangelo's famous sculpture, the Pieta. It was a very early work for the artist. He was not yet 25 years old when he carved this. And it really stands out as one of the most exceptional, perhaps one of the most moving sculptures ever made. So the year is uh, just before the year 1500. And, uh, and like I said, Michelangelo is essentially an up and comer, <laughs> up and coming artist at this point. So let's talk a little bit about what makes this particular work so exceptional. Now, it really is this balance that, that Michelangelo has struck with this work. We've, we've got male versus female, horizontal versus vertical. We've got um, uh, nude versus clothed. It's the study of, of contrast, but uh, essentially what we're looking at is the dead Christ who has come down off of the, the, the cross uh, after being crucified, and he's in his mother's arms. Now, Michelangelo did not invent this, this kind of image. Uh, artists had been making it for centuries, and they typically used it as a moment as an opportunity to describe the horror that, that Christ's body had experienced and then to describe the, or suggest the emotional horror of, of his mother's experience looking at this, at this body. And Michelangelo takes a different approach. With this roughly life-size sculpture here, I, I should mention that, that really the Virgin would be way over life-size if she were to stand up. With this roughly life-size sculpture, instead of focusing on, on the horror, on the violence, instead he makes these figures divinely beautiful. Um, they are stunningly gorgeous. They don't need halos. They are perfect in their own right. I mean, Mary here is supposed to be the mother of a 33-year-old man, and she looks like she's about 18 years old. She, uh, she's just absolutely gorgeous. Now, one last detail that I wanted to draw your attention to, and it's the detail that my eye always goes to when I'm looking at the Pieta. It's this detail of her hand here. One hand is sort of pushing up his flesh underneath his armpit there and the other hand is sort of you know 
almost offering him up. But I remember when I saw this as like a 20 something, when I was so young, I used to think of, of it as like a questioning pose, like why me, why my son? Um, but of course, you know, my understanding of it has, has evolved over time. But I think that that is where her, her, um, her sadness is. It's all kind of channeled into that pose. And that brings us to this event <laughs> where this young man, um, uh, uh, he was a Hungarian born Australian geologist named Laszlo Toth. In 1972, he's sort of bumming around Rome um, without really anything to do. And he's becoming increasingly erratic and unstable. He begins telling people that he is Michelangelo. And then he begins telling people that he is Jesus. And one day he walks into the Vatican with his Jesus geologist hammer and he gets about 12 15 good wax at the pieta and this is a dramatic photo where you can see people gathering around him and stopping him from doing this attack but you can also see that he um, inflicted significant damage on this work of art sadly that that arm that significant arm is completely separated from the body uh, mary's hand is uh, is broken into multiple pieces that you know that delicate gesture that 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 I was just showing you. And Mary's face was significantly damaged as well. Her eyelids, her nose, her veil. And so at this point, you might be thinking, well, she looked fine the last time I saw her. So, so what happened here? Amazingly, the Vatican had already taken a complete perfect mold of this work of art. So they were able to perfectly restore it uh, despite the violence that was inflicted upon it. Despite the fact that there were some people there who even picked up little pieces of Michelangelo's sculpture and brought it home as a souvenir, which is really not a very moral thing to do when you're standing in St. Peter's Basilica. Anyways, so the work um, has been restored. It's still there at, at uh, St. Peter's and it is, um, of course, also behind bulletproof glass. That brings us to our next work that has been attacked, um, another master work from, uh, from European history. Now we're moving to, uh, to the Netherlands. We're moving to Amsterdam, to their answer to the Louvre. It's the Rijksmuseum. When you go to the Rijksmuseum, the work of art you have to see is Rembrandt's masterwork, The Night Watch from 1642. A lot of Rembrandt here tonight. This is his his, um, his revolutionary work in terms of uh, group portraiture. Uh, prior to this, uh, groups were getting their portraits done all the time. Everybody would pay to have their faces included and artists would just line them up like school picture day. Rembrandt decides to show this militia group as though there's been a call to arms and they're all assembling and striding forward and, um, and putting on completely anachronistic armor and that sort of thing. But it's a really dramatic picture for that reason. It's called the Night Watch because it was heavily varnished and it looks like a night scene to this uh, to our modern day eyes, but it was not supposed to be a night scene and nor was it originally called Night Watch. It's a strange and fascinating painting. There are so many details here that art historians don't even really know how to make sense out of. The detail that I always loved and really was drawn to since college is this little golden girl in the middle ground. If you look very closely, she has a dead chicken hanging upside down from her belt here. So there's a lot going on in this painting. And probably because of that, it has been this kind of target for people who have felt sort of abandoned, dispossessed by the state. And so they go into this museum at, with their sights set on this master work of art. An unemployed shoemaker attacked it in 1911, bad year for art. That was the year that the Mona Lisa was stolen. Um, in the 1970s, an unemployed school teacher came in and also attacked it with these massive zigzag slashes across it. Not too long after that, somebody came in with acid and threw acid at the painting 
luckily the guards there uh, were able to act quickly and uh, uh, neutralize that acid. They were trained to do just that. So this work has been sort of perfectly preserved over the years so that masses and of, of people and huge crowds can come and see it and examine it up, up close and personal. The other kind of fun detail here is that this painting actually has an escape hatch in the floor. If there were ever to be a flood or a fire, it would immediately drop into like a, essentially like an airplane black box and be perfectly preserved. So, um, so over the years, there have been all these different kinds of preservation efforts with this work. But in, in 2019, they did a live restoration that they streamed online so you could get right in close and personal and see all the details that have apparently just driven some people mad over the years. So the last work that we're going to look at that has been attacked is a really unusual example because this is a work that has essentially been attacked by the artist himself. The artist in this case is the anonymous graffiti artist, uh, England, uh, uh, English artist who is a political activist, a film director, but really best known for his tags that uh, have appeared all over the globe. And I, I'm of course talking about the artist Banksy. These are two, uh, two examples of some of his most famous works. Banksy has a really complicated relationship with the world of fine art. Here's one of his uh, tags that says this will look nice when it's framed because of course uh, they've become collector's items. When he graffitis a building, it actually increases the property value now. And every now and then he does um, have uh, works of art that are like authenticated by a company that he created called Pest Control. And then he'll sell those works at auction. And of course, celebrities have been buying them up. They're, they're real collector's items now. But uh, some of his best loved works uh, started off just as tags around London, including the girl with the red balloon that we can see over here on this stairway. She began to appear around London in 2002. And this is maybe one of Banksy's most iconic images. He, uh, he recreated it uh, and had it authenticated for sale at Sotheby's just a few years ago. And you probably all know by now that right after somebody purchased that work of art, that print in this case, uh, right as the gavel dropped and, and, and the auctioneer said sold, this painting was partially shredded by the, the, by the very frame that it sat in. So somebody had just purchased it for 1.3 million. And you can see the look of shock and surprise by the faces on the faces of the people who witnessed its destruction. Now, this was all part of uh, Banksy's plan. He actually released uh, videos via social media shortly thereafter, showing how the frame itself was built, designed to shred this work of art. He was sort of thumbing his nose at the fine art world, but Sotheby's loved it. Even the person that bought the shredded object loved it because ultimately Banksy's pest control, his authentic authentication company, authentic, uh, uh, made this uh, uh, authentic authenticated this work as a brand new work of art by Banksy. So, and Sotheby's hailed it as like the first time a work of art, a new work of art had been made live at an auction before. So, um, so somebody was, ended up being really happy that, that Banksy's work of art was destroyed right after they bought it. All right. So in our last few minutes here, we're going to turn our attention to art frauds, um, copies, forgeries, and Banksy is, are, is going to be a nice segue for us because there's the famous quote oftentimes attributed to Picasso, the bad artists imitate the great artists steal. And in this case, Banksy uh, steals the quote from Pablo Picasso. So we're going to consider how some really famous artists have stolen or, um, or sort of fudged the authenticity of their work and then how some lesser known forgers have managed to make big bucks off of this kind of work. So first and very quickly, going back to Michelangelo, we, um, we know that he, he launched himself with a fraud. In fact, he was celebrated as a young artist. He had this incredible talent, but one of the ways that he got known very early on, and of course, this is a portrait of Michelangelo from much later in his life, but when he was a young man, one of the things that he did was he created a sculpture 
sculpture of a sleeping Cupid, very similar to what you see over here on the right, but the, the actual sculpture has since been lost. This one's in the collection of the Met. And what he did with this work is that he actually applied chemicals to it to make it look like it was not newly made, but was in fact something created by the ancient Romans. And so that it was more like a found artifact than something that he had just produced. And he was able to fool everyone. And when, um, when this trickery was revealed, instead of um, getting upset with Michelangelo, people hailed him because he had this ability to carve in the same way that the ancients were carving, but also that he could fool people. Uh, so in this case, a little bit of trickery ended up spinning the right way for Michelangelo and it helped him to launch his career. Now, the same cannot be said with the artist Salvador Dali, the great showman over here with the signature mustache. We all know him for his surrealist paintings, in particular, uh, The Persistence of Memory from the early 1930s. This work is at the, um, the Museum of Modern Art, famous for the clocks melting like cheese on a hot day, the collection of insects as though they are decaying um, like some sort of organic matter, and then this blob right there at the center of the picture that seems to bear a likeness to the artist himself. Now, he was a showman and throughout his career, he sort of chased celebrity and, and, um, and money, maybe a little bit more than he chased you know, the creative process. And so his reputation sort of began to wane even while he was alive. But there was one instance in particular that really damaged his reputation. Like so many artists for centuries, that came before Dali, he had students, he had apprentices, and, um, and apparently he, he just gave them um, blank sheets of paper that he had signed in advance for them to produce works of art that were sort of in his style. And this process is sort of backwards from the way master artists have always worked. Typically, maybe they would contribute something, maybe the students would contribute something, and only after the master had reviewed it and decided that it was sort of up to his standards would he or she contribute their name, their, their, their signature to increase the value of, of this work of art. But for Dali, it was revealed that he was just signing blank pieces of paper and, and giving it off to other people to create. So to, to this day, it's really hard to authenticate Dali prints. In particular, he sort of damaged his own reputation by doing this. I've been in some very nice houses before that had a lot of Dali prints, and I thought they probably paid too much for this. <laughs> so the next two cases of forgery are by artists that you probably have never heard of before. These aren't famous artists. They're not in any sort of art. Art history, art history book, but these are artists that could conjure up works that look almost exactly like master paintings. So we're looking at an artist here named John Myatt. And, um, and you can see over here from the painting that he's standing next to that he could create paintings that look exactly like originals, in this case, a self-portrait by Vincent van Gogh. Now, John Myatt has a fascinating story because during the 1980s, he, um, he decided that he would leave his job so he could spend more time with his kids. And he always had this kind of easy technical ability when making works of art. He could make something that looks just like something else, no matter what the style was. And so he began to, um, you know, because he needed money, he began to, to sort of uh, advertise this ta talent in a trade magazine for private detectives. But this ability, fell into the wrong hands. And he uh, and, and so he, he got a regular client named John Drew, who was essentially uh, buying his work and then later on commissioning his work and then eventually working in cahoots with him to pass off John Myatt's paintings as originals and insert them into the art market. His, um, his partner in crime here, John Drew, uh, went above and beyond in creating a, a paper trail for these works, creating documents to um, of authenticity so that people who were buying them really believed that they were getting original works by the hand of the master artist that, um, that John Myatt had copied. 
Now, eventually these men were brought to justice. They served tiny little prison sentences, despite the fact that they had earned about 25 million pounds over the course of, of this fraud that they were committing. These days, John Maya is a free man and he is making money for himself by creating genuine fakes. So people know that they're getting a fake girl with the pearl earring when they sign up to work with John Myatt. And I think everything comes full circle because I think that even now there are artists who are creating fake John Myatt paintings. <laughs> so we'll end with one last great uh, forger and his name is Elmer de Hori. Now he has a fascinating story in his own right too. He has is um he grew up as a young man, he was in a concentration camp during the Holocaust. When he when the war was over, he was living in Paris. He was a young broke artist and he and he was trying to to you know sell works on the street and that sort of thing and he wasn't having much luck but if he made something in the style of picasso and didn't sign it people were a lot were much more interested in in buying that and so over the years over many years he would have a couple of people here and there that worked as his partners that would then uh Pre present and promote his work as being the original, uh, whether he's, you know, uh, ripping off Picasso or Modigliani or Matisse. And I have a few examples of this. He, um, he was typically doing works in the style of an artist, not trying to replicate works exactly. So here's the original Picasso. Here is, um, here's the, the fraudulent work over here on the right. Here's the original Modigliani. Here's something that's created within the style of Modigliani. And here is his fake um, Matisse. I mean, I think to the average person, you wouldn't be able to know which one was fake. It's this one on the right. And it was actually um, a curator at Harvard that helped to uh, sort of pin this down because Amir Dahori and his partner had just sold the, the Harvard Art Museums some pr some prints, I believe. And then they came back and they said, oh, you like the prints? We also have these this Matisse. And the curator thought to themselves, no, this all looks like it's done by the same hand. And eventually um, helped to bring this artist to justice. Now, he once said, if my work hangs in a museum long enough, it becomes real. He forged at least a thousand works of art, and they were inserted into the art market. They were inserted into museums around the world. So it, it, um, it raises a lot of questions about, you know, when we go to a museum, are we looking at authentic art objects or are we looking at really smart forgeries? So, um, so we'll wrap up tonight. It's right at eight o'clock. This is the perfect time to conclude with just our big ideas. What are our takeaways from tonight? Well, the first is that um, we have this great reminder that the authenticity of an original art, art object still has tremendous value to us as a culture because otherwise we'd just put copies of these sculptures up at the Parthenon. Otherwise, we'd just print up some copies for, for the uh, Isabel Stewart Gardner and that would just be enough. No, it's not. We know that those original artworks have a home and they need to be restored to where they belong. The other big takeaway for tonight is that the wanton destruction of artworks is not just violence. It's like violence enacted against humanity. These works of art have incredible value to us as a civilization. And of course, a violent act like the destruction of the Pieta has these rippling effects in religion, politics, and of course, the art world. And then when it comes to fraud to forgery, we are reminded that, um, that the original art object still has significant meaning to us, that, you know, <laughs> that, that uh, imitation is still the most sincerest form of flattery. But even in the age of digital photography, the authentic art object is what is going to continue to intrigue us and draw us to museums for years to come. So I will end there for now. And if anybody has any questions or comments or corrections for me, um, you can feel free to use the chat or I'm sure there's a, a chance to uh, raise a hand or if you'd like to have a conversation, maybe we, we can figure out a way to do that too. I have two questions that have been submitted. And um, one is what happened to all the artwork that Hitler stole? Mm. stole? So almost all of it. Well, well everything 
in that particular uh, salt mine was uh, to the best of the monuments men ability. And the monuments men were not just uh, American soldiers, it was a group of experts that were uh, represented the all of the allies in World War II. And they did their best to restore those to those works of art to their original owners. A lot of the works in that salt mine were from major museums. Some of them were stolen from individuals. And as often as possible, they tried to, to restore that. But imagine, I mean, it was before the internet, it was before there was any paper trail. And the monuments men had no resources. They didn't have time telephones. They didn't even have like Jeeps. <laughs> they were doing like really hard work with, with no resources. So to the best of their abilities, they got these works back to the countries where they belong, to the individuals where they belong, but it was a long, slow process. Just that one, one castle that we saw, the new Schweinstein castle, it took them a year to empty it. It was 40 boxcar trains, uh, train loads full of artwork. And, and it's like, how do you get it back to everybody? They did the best they could. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I think Catherine is going to ask a question. Sure. Yes, hi Jane. Um, I wonder if you would like to comment further on the Elgin marbles because there was an article in the New York Times just recently saying that the uh, British Museum has been very carefully carving a copy set. And I don't know if their plan is to offer that to the Greeks or to offer them the if they anticipate um, demand to return the originals, or who's who will keep the copy? I I just find that uh, an interesting dilemma and a coincidence that you brought it up um, this in your talk and your wonderful talk. So thank you. Oh, Catherine, thanks for your comment. And I actually missed that article. I'm going to have to go look it up. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now I know that there is a museum in in Athens where it's like. They would love to have the originals back, even like I, if 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 the the nation of Greece was restored these artifacts, they wouldn't go back on the Parthenon. So there's there is museum space that's like ready for it. But wow, I can't imagine the British Museum giving up the originals. That will be a very interesting to see how that unfolds. And, you know, when you um, are you when you're particularly interested in the things that I'm interested in, when I go on social media, all I see since the death of the Queen is really like all of these people thinking like, will these things from the British Museum, not just the Elgin Marbles, but all of these other things, will they will they start restoring them to to um, to the countries that that made them? So it's it's a great big thorny issue. And um, and, you know, I hope for the people of Greece that they can get the originals back. That would really that would really I, I mean, change the museum world. That would be, you know, a, a, a tidal wave in the museum world. Uh, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, since you bring up it's a very sensitive subject now um, with people revisiting collections that were acquired from by a, a colonized, an imperial country acquires a, another country and um, uh, takes the artwork back to their museums. And another example was recently the return of a number of the Benin sculptures to Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just, they, I, I just wonder if, if this is going to, if you, I wonder if you think this is going to increase or are these just a one-off or do you, it's going to be slow? I don't, I think it's just, these are the only two that I've noticed lately. And um, I, I just curious to know where it's going to go. I, this is such a great question, Catherine. And it, you know, if I, it, off the top of my head, I would say that the people that I know that work in museums tend to be um, the type of people that would want to restore objects to the places where, to the, to the cultures and communities that where they originated from. I think there is an overwhelming sort of uh, push in that direction, at least from the people that work in museums. I don't know if I can speak to the boards that run museums, that might be sort of a different demographic there. Um, but, but I think we'll be seeing more of this in the future for sure. Um, it, there's, a, 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 I mean, museums are having really interesting 
uh, roles and conversations around the restoration of objects around uh, conversations around climate change too. There, you know, you, you probably hear stories here and there about, you know, climate change activists like gluing themselves to works of art to get in the news. And the head, like the head of conservation um, associations, uh, national associations are saying, do it because honestly, climate change is a much bigger threat to these workers of art than somebody gluing you know, themselves to a piece of glass. So for the most part, people who work in museums, I think are really sort of uh, oriented towards doing the right things for the collections, doing the right things uh, for the, the cultures and communities that, that created the works too. I think, I thank you. I think that's, I, you know, I think of it in comparison to the NAGPRA, which is the Native American Grave Protections uh, Act, which is very uneven in the response of museums to return items, but it's a federal decision. So I'm just like wondering if you could be president and have an executive order, would you make a, uh, you know, should certain very important cultural objects be returned as you know, is um, thought provoking, and it, it um, really is because I'm sure there are people on the other side who are saying we have the best possible house and protection for the object in a museum. You know, so that the the the, the maximum number of people have access to it and can appreciate it. And so, I mean, certainly there's a debate on either side. Thank you for a great program. It's Thank really you been so great. much for coming tonight, Catherine. I appreciate it, and thanks for your comments. Um, there's another question about uh, whether there is an appropriate solution for handling artwork like the statues of Robert E. Lee. Um, is that, do you think have a, uh, do you have an example that you think has been managed well? Sure. Um, I don't know if I have a great example, but I will say this. In the art historical circles that I travel in, it's really a no-brainer because generally speaking, art historians understand that most people don't learn history from public sculpture. Public sculpture is, um, it signifies power, signifies authority. It's more symbolic than it is historical. So in, in art historical circles, it, it's the, it's a no-brainer. It's like take it out of that context because we don't want it to signify that. We don't want it to represent that in our culture. You can put it in a museum, you can house it in, in, in another context where you can provide history around it so that people understand what they're looking at, but don't put it up on a pedestal and, and represent to anybody that it means something <laughs> other than, than, than what, well, that it means something other than how, how it was originally intended. And of course, those are, you know, seen as racist symbols today. So, um, so, but that's, that's the art historical understanding of it. I don't know that there's any great example that I'm, I'm familiar with where something's been taken off you and represented in another way that, that shows that context. But just in Boston, there was a sculpture group that was sort of like Civil War era or just, um, just after it, uh, that was called the Emancipation Group. And in that sculpture, the way the African-American man was was, was sculpted, even though it was paid for by emancipated slaves, it was still really, really questionable. And it wasn't like the, the best representation of, of an African-American person. And so that sculpture, it was just decided was taken off of view and they were sort of figuring out where it belonged. So I think it's perfectly fine to think, okay, we can take something off of view because it doesn't represent what we hold sacred or important to our culture today. Um, I mean, that's something as we could see from the program is always changing in a culture. We shouldn't think of these things as, um, as static and permanent because it's a, a, we as a culture are changing too. So thank you for the question. Okay, so that's all the questions that's in the chat. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Oh, I see a great question from Jim here. Have there been any psychological studies why a forger would choose to forge an artwork other than paint their own works? 
Jim, that's a fascinating question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for it. I, I'm not aware of any psychological studies, but you know, going back to this idea that it's like, it's part of a training, you know, and it's, uh, it's sort of essential to an artist training. Like you should be able to copy this masterwork and create something that's very similar to it. I think for most people, it's hard to find their own vision, whether it's in the visual arts or whether it's, you know, you know, in whatever field they're in, it's hard to come up with that creative vision. So I would say it's somebody that is technically talented, but maybe creatively blocked. <laughs> the best they can do is just copy something. But that's a great question. My, do you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my experience um, in the art world is that a lot of times people in my profession uh, would purposely try to hide their works as a challenge to see if somebody else could possibly find their works or to identify them as being a forgery. It's more like uh, a challenge uh, to the establishment yeah. to, to see if they can be discovered. Right. It's, it's almost like a little game. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. That's a whole other dimension to it. And that I feel like has all the makings for a very good movie, Jim. <laughs> so you might want to think about doing some screenwriting there because that's a movie I'd like to watch. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Oh, this is Catherine again. Um, I wonder in your work, Jane, if you've been interviewed the uh, anyone at a museum working in provenance, I which is you know before something can be acquired or purchased, I understand that someone has to prove a history of ownership, et cetera. And I would expect that's like a detective work now to really be super thorough. Have you have you interviewed anyone that does that kind of work, and how do they? I, I, I'm just fascinated by that. I think that there's tremendous pressure to really not make any mistakes. Right, right. And then it's, you know, it's, well, so that's called provenance research. And so basically if, if a work of art was made prior to World War II, now there has to be this, pro, there has to be a history of provenance, uh, a, a detailed history before uh, a museum and most collectors would buy that work to prove that it is in fact the authentic object and that it was never stolen by the Nazis and not yet restored to the original owner. It has completely um, complicated <laughs> the movement and the, and the purchasing and the sale of, of, of artwork. And the closest experience that I've had to provenance research really was that when I was in grad school, one of my roommates was uh, worked in provenance research at the MFA. So I, I mean, it's, it's, pretty straightforward research in a lot of ways because most of the times when a work of art changes hands, there's a record of it on, on the back of the painting. Um, other, other times, like, I mean, you have to dive into like exhibition histories and all of this, but it, I mean, it's fascinating in its own right for sure. And it's amazing to think that because of Hitler, because of the Nazis, it has forever changed the way we're going to think about sort of this transfer, like the record of the transfer of ownership of, of works of art. But that is like a whole other fascinating thread to the history of art, for sure. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So interesting. Well, you ask fascinating questions too, Catherine. I feel like you rounded out this, this program in so many great ways. <laughs> If there are no more questions, and I'm just making sure nobody has their hand raised or anything. Okay. Last chance, as is there anyone, does anyone have any questions? If not, I hope you all enjoy the talk as much as I did. And I'm glad I actually turned on my camera because a lot of times when the image showed up, I like, coming up close to see it and so it was it was so great to have this talk and don't forget we have three more in uh, in the next three months and it's always on the last wednesday so it's very easy to remember and if you want to sign up for it just come to the library's website the library is 
Our website is foxlive.org in the event calendar and can sign up for it. And so thank you so much, Jane, for this fascinating talk. And I look forward to our next one. Awesome. So thank you all for coming. And I'm going to stop the recording. And